what are corporate bonds? What are the two main types of corporate bonds? And how can you start investing in corporate bonds? Hello, members and super savers. I hope you're having a good week. These are the three topics that we'll be covering in today's video because a lot of you have been asking about corporate bonds lately. And no wonder as yields on new issue corporate bonds seem to have finally started inching noticeably upwards. So that there's no confusion, I'll be using the terms corporate bonds, corporate debt, and corporates interchangeably throughout this video, and generally speaking, on our channel. Meaning that when I say corporates, I'm referring to corporate bonds or corporate debt issued by both financial and non-financial companies. At the time of this taping, this is the top yield on new issue corporate debt. This one here is callable in about 12 months time. And this one here is callable in about 24 months time. As you can see, all the top yields currently are offered by financial services companies and more specifically by banks. Seems the banks need the money as deposits are increasingly switching over to more higher yielding alternatives. So all the new issue corporates we've seen in recent months have been callable. If you're newer to us and want to learn more about callable bonds and how they might fit into your overall bond portfolio, I've linked this callable bonds 101 video in the video description below for easy reference. As usual, here's our front of video disclaimer. For a detailed disclaimer, please refer to the end of this video. Let's dive in now, folks. So far on this channel, we focus primarily on government and quasi-government debt securities, such as treasuries, agency bonds, and municipal bonds. Corporate bonds are different in this respect. As many of you have heard me say before, Treasuries are explicitly backed by the full faith and credit of the United States government. Agency bonds may be explicitly backed or implicitly backed by the full faith and credit of the United States government. And some municipal bonds may also be backed by the full faith and credit of the municipality issuing those bonds or by revenues from a specific source and or project. Corporate bonds are neither implicitly nor explicitly backed by the full faith and credit of the U.S. government or any municipality. And that's because corporate bonds are issued by private and or public companies and therefore backed by the credit of the issuing companies and by the credit of the issuing companies only. So here's what happens when I buy a corporate bond. That's me and I'm essentially lending my money to a company. The company in turn promises to pay me interest regularly, usually two times a year, and to pay me back my initial investment my principal, when the bond matures. This means that I'm relying on the financial health of the company issuing this bond and its ability and willingness to pay the interest and principal that it owes me. And one of the key ways to assess a company's financial health, its credit risk, is via its credit rating. Credit ratings try to predict the ability of a company to meet its obligation in the future, to measure the default risk of a company, so to speak. The market typically splits corporate bonds into two broad categories based on credit ratings, investment grade debt with a generally low default risk and non-investment grade debt, sometimes also referred to as high yield debt, speculative grade debt or junk bonds. And as you can see from the progression of names, higher default risk applies here than with investment grade debt. Here's what the investment grade credit ratings look like. And here's what the non-investment grade credit ratings look like. Check out this member video linked below on credit ratings and credit risk if you're relatively new to all of this or to the world of bonds in general. Now, let's go through some numbers to show you the difference in average cumulative default rates between investment grade debt versus non-investment grade debt. Here's S&P Global Ratings 2022 Annual U.S. Corporate Default and Rating Transition Study. Let's scroll down to this table comparing the U.S. Corporate Average Cumulative Default Rates between 1981 and 2022. Average Cumulative Default Rate is a mouthful, by the way, but in essence, it describes the overall likelihood, the overall probability that a company will default on its debt over a certain period of time. For investment grade debt, the average cumulative default rate after five years is 1.06%. 
after 10 years, 2.40%, and after 15 years, 3.39%. Compare that to speculative grade debt, non-investment grade debt, where the average cumulative default rate after 5 years is 15.78%, after 10 years, 22.41%, and after 15 years, 25.84%. That's quite a difference in the likelihood of default between investment grade debt and non-investment grade debt. But of course, higher risk should also typically bring higher returns. And that's one of the main reasons why some investors find non-investment grade debt attractive. The possibility that they might earn more if they're willing to take on the additional risk. The focus of this video though and of our channel in general for the time being will be investment grade debt. Because in my mind, moving from treasuries, which many of our members and super savers hold, and which are for all practical purposes, free of credit risk, to speculative grade debt, which is chock full of credit risk, it's simply too big of a jump right now. I also feel that it's not the right jump currently, given my working assumption that there will be more defaults of speculative grade debt in 2024 and 2025 if economic conditions worsen. Higher interest rates and bad times usually mean more and worse defaults, especially for non-investment grade loans. So let's save those junk bonds for another day or year perhaps. So now that we have some corporate bond basics under our belt, let's talk a bit about the two main types of corporate bonds out there in the market. There are two main types of corporate bonds, secured bonds and unsecured bonds. Secured bonds are bonds for which the company has pledged specific assets as collateral. So for example, if you have a bond secured by the company's real estate holdings, its buildings, your chances of being repaid in bankruptcy are much better than for other creditors who don't have such collateral pledges. Unsecured bonds are bonds for which there are no specific claims on any of the company's actual assets, but just a general claim to be repaid. There's usually a whole hierarchy amongst unsecured bonds. For example, senior unsecured debt will be repaid before subordinated debt, also known as junior debt. Unsecured bonds, bonds without a special claim to the company's assets, are more commonly seen in the investment grade category for two reasons. Reason number one is because issuing secured bonds carries a cost for the company. Some of its assets will be tied up and there is a not insignificant administrative burden to keep all those pledges and liens always up to date. And reason number two is that most investors who purchase investment grade debt tend to rely more on that company's overall health than the underlying assets anyway. So while secured bonds will usually carry a lower coupon than unsecured bonds, all else being equal, the difference may not be that big for the best rated companies and often not justify the extra administrative burden. In a nutshell, companies that issue secured bonds often do this because they have to. And that's why investors tend to see more secured bonds in the non-investment grade category than in the investment grade category. Whether the corporate bond you're buying is a secured bond, a senior unsecured bond, or subordinated bond is very important if the company you're considering investing in ever has a crisis or worse, goes bankrupt. Of course, this isn't something that you want to think about when you're investing in a company, but even the best companies go through bad times. And in times of crisis, corporate bonds with a higher priority within a company's debt hierarchy will usually hold their value better, while subordinated debt will typically lose value much earlier and much more substantially. And then there's actual default and bankruptcy. As we've shown you from this S&P table earlier, companies can and do go bankrupt. However, there is a common misconception that investors lose everything when a company goes bankrupt. And this isn't necessarily always the case because in reality, when a company goes bankrupt, in most cases, there will be some assets left as well as a looming fight over who gets how much. The rules about who gets first dibs 
to lay a claim on what's left are fairly complex, but generally speaking, here's how bond and equity holders are prioritized when a company enters bankruptcy. Secured bondholders have first priority. They get first dibs basically on the assets that are specifically pledged to them. Next in line are the senior unsecured bondholders. Then come the subordinated bondholders and at the very end are the equity holders, those who own stock in the company. And the higher your bonds are ranked, the better the chances of you getting back some or even all of what's due to you. In a nutshell, not all bonds are necessarily equal in bankruptcy and there can be a complex hierarchy of who has priority over whom among different classes of bondholders. This can be very complicated, especially for larger companies with often intricate balance sheets and debt structures. So in real life, when a company does go bankrupt, the matter of which classes of bondholders get what and how much is often sorted out in bankruptcy court proceedings that can take years. Meaning that if you're the bondholder of a bankrupt company, it may take you a very long time to get back some or all of the interest and principal repayment that's owed to you. When a company does go bankrupt, the payout that's given to bondholders, if any, is called the recovery rate. In a separate study, S&P gives the following nominal recovery rates for U.S. issuers from 1987 through to September 2022 at the dollar weighted rate. Senior secured bonds at 65%. Senior unsecured bonds at 48%. Senior subordinated bonds at 35% and all other subordinated bonds at 32%. Keep in mind that this whole system of who gets priority in case of a bankruptcy and the varying recovery rates means that corporate bonds are much more varied, complex investment than treasuries, which for all practical purposes are free of credit risks. While I know some of you in our super saving community have ongoing worries about the possibility of a U.S. default, the fact remains that to this day, the U.S. has not defaulted, despite a debt ceiling crisis every few years. And the fact also remains that to this day, treasuries remain the safest, most liquid fixed income investments in the world. And that's because markets don't really think that our country will go bankrupt and default on our debt unlike the companies that issue corporate bonds. And that's why with corporate bonds, it's so important to understand where the bond you're thinking of buying stands in the company's debt hierarchy, whether you're holding secured bonds, senior unsecured bonds, subordinated bonds, or something in between. Having said all this, as we showed you earlier from this S&P analysis, the risk of default amongst investment grade companies has been relatively low historically. I just think it's important for you before you dive into corporate bond investing to know that as unlikely as a bankruptcy scenario may be, it is still a possibility in the world of corporates, unlike in the world of treasuries. But this higher risk also typically means higher returns, which is a great segue into the next section of our video. You can buy corporate bonds via the leading brokers, Fidelity, Schwab, and Vanguard, either as new issues or on the secondary market, just like for treasuries. With regard to fees for new issues purchased online, all three leading brokers do not charge you a separate transaction fee, but they may get a selling concession in the process. A selling concession is when Fidelity, Schwab, and Vanguard, or any other broker for that matter, receive compensation from bond issuers for participating in a new issue offering as a selling group member and or underwriter. For new issues purchased online, the minimum purchase quantity is usually a $1,000 face amount, and the incremental purchase quantity is typically also a $1,000 face amount. For secondary market corporate bond trades, the charge is typically a dollar per thousand dollar face amount with different minimum and maximum charges depending on the broker. Minimum and incremental purchase quantities both vary as they're market and broker dependent. And if you call in to place your order, you'll have to pay the customary speak to a human being charge, 
ranging anywhere from about $20 to $25, depending on which brokerage company you're with. So what do you think? Do you want to learn more about corporate bonds or are treasuries just fine for you? Either way, drop a comment below with your top of mind corporate bond questions if you have any. All right, members and super savers, as always, I hope you enjoyed this video and learned something new. And if you did, join us for a chat at our live member Q&A here, happening right now if you're watching this video when it aired on Friday, October 27th, around 5 p.m. Otherwise, there's always the replay. And be sure to check out this October member video that'll be going up in a few days time where I dive deeper into corporate bond investing and when we expect corporate bond yields to get even more attractive. To learn more about Diamond Nest Egg membership, visit our channel page or the join link in the video description below. See you again very soon with more brand new wealth building content for your financial journey.